Okay, here we are again. Now it's the continuation of my Oscar quest. Uh, tonight I saw Lincoln, and here's my reaction to it. Thank you, Steven Spielberg. Thank you, you have given us a great film once again. Boy, I don't know where to begin with this. Uh, Lincoln was phenomenal. I loved it from start to finish. Uh, it was a great story, and um, and it's really some uh, one of the best acted pieces of the year. Boy, this is a great film. Um, boy, I don't know where to start. Um, I think probably where I should start is just the central story. And the, that central story is Abraham Lincoln in his uh, right before his uh, official start of his second term in 1865 uh, is going or go, is trying to pass the Thirteenth Amendment to the Constitution, which is, of course, to free all the slaves. Um, and uh, also at the same time, he's uh, entering peace talks to end the Civil War. Um, by the way, the Civil War, I thought, uh, some people I've heard criticize it because they don't feel like the Civil War, when they're talking about these peace talks, doesn't feel like it's the Civil War. It just feels like maybe a, a small war. No, I don't think so. Just the way um, the film actually starts with a little clip uh, like maybe 20 seconds long of soldiers from North and South fighting and it's brutal. It's really brutal. You see people stabbed, you see people getting stepped on and stuff and it's just brutal and we're forced to say to ourselves four years of that. Four years over what they, over what, like a million people killed? Whatever it was, uh, in this war <clears throat> that some say is completely unnecessary, and, it, and I, I think it, it was. But it had to happen in order for us to understand just how bad it is if we all can agree. And of course, that's it's hard to imagine four years of that. And nobody alive today, of course, knows what that's like. But uh, boy, this depiction of it, I thought, was nicely accurate, even if it's you know, the only, pretty much the only thing we get out of the Civil War in the whole movie. Um, coming off of War Horse, a lot of people said, well, Spielberg, you know, what's his next movie about George Washington or something when he was leading the revolution? Well, based on what he did here with, uh, his, um, with his actors, particularly Daniel Day-Lewis, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't say no to that. Um, actually, I just heard his next project got yanked from the release schedule, so... Uh, evidently he's picking something else, or that story is going to take a while, but, but, uh, yeah, I think, um, this was better than War Horse. If you saw my, uh, top ten list from last year, War Horse was, like, number five or number four. This is probably in my top three, and I've had to rearrange my lists in seeing it now. Right now it's in my, like, top four, top three, somewhere in there. Uh, Argo was still slightly better, and then, um... What else? Skyfall, I might have liked a little bit more. But both films, uh, you know, are, th both of those films, I should say, really great, spectacular stuff that we'll remember for a long time. And Lincoln, I think, is added to that. You know, these three films, at least in my top ten, and probably a couple more in my top ten, you could say, are instant classics. I mean, they're not going to be forgotten. Three years from now, people are still going to be watching Lincoln. They're still going to be watching Skyfall. They're still going to be watching Argo. Uh, versus, for example, three years from now, I doubt anybody would know, um, I don't know, playing for keeps or something, you know, crap like that. So I'm just saying, if, um, you know, if people are doubting Lincoln at all to be a, an instant classic, make that your judge. And still, if it's a film that people can remember three years down the road, like, you know, right now, let's see, what came out in 2010 that I remember? Oh, yeah, Inception. I remember Inception. That's an instant classic. But then again, I also remember a film called The A-Team. That's not an instant classic, but it was, for me, it was good. But, but, uh, but yeah, I think um, that's not to be the judge, though, for sure, whether or not it's an instant classic. But in this case, Lincoln totally was. Okay, so after this brief war scene, we're introduced to Abraham Lincoln as he's talking to a few uh, northern soldiers, both two black and two white. And uh, the black are, you know, pretty much saying, you know, uh, how different it is to be a Negro fighting for the North 
versus a white man fighting for the North. And that whole issue uh, of black versus white, of course, is the essential part of the passing of the 13th Amendment and therefore the central part of the film. And uh, the N-word is only used, I don't know, maybe three or four times, but... Uh, um, and it was never something that took my notice, like, like uh, something that I had that I had rolling in my mind through the whole film. But uh, certainly, it's the central issue, and it's tackled very, very well. The N word is not overused, nor I think is it underused. Um, I think it's used just the right amount. But uh, from what I've heard, there's this film called this is a little tiny film that Quentin Tarantino made this year called Django Unchained, which uses that word a lot more, but. I haven't seen it yet, so I can't, you know, compare the two at all. Uh, and, and that's set before the Civil War, from what I understand. Okay, and, okay, where do I begin with Daniel Day-Lewis? His role was not, or he did, he did not give a performance in the film. He was transformed into Abraham Lincoln. You know, all the history books and all that, they imagine this brute young guy, you know, growing up in the wilderness who became, or not really wilderness, but, you know, in the log cabins and stuff like that, and saving the pig from the, you know, all that. No, this is a man who's, at this point, four years in the war, he's weary, he's tired, he's worn down, but he still has a sense of humor and he still has a lot of optimism about getting this war over with and getting all this these problems straightened out so it doesn't start up again. And that is essentially the man, but uh, it's not the man we really think of. You know, why, people say? Nobody wants to picture a president, especially one of that importance, being a tired old man with a really kind of higher voice, you know. But Daniel Day-Lewis, the way that audiences have accepted him, and, uh, and critics as well, it definitely proves you can transform an American hero like that and take an image that some people say and turn it on its head and give them what the person really, wa really was. Like, uh, yeah, from Abraham Lincoln, from, you know, little, Phil, you know, growing up without a mother and the, you know, chopping down trees and all that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, certainly not. But you get the, really him and you turn that image on its head to pretty much all we remember is, is the weary old tired president. But not to say there's anything wrong with that. Because I, I like truth in my films. I don't really like uh, depictions that make it more, you know, more pretty, if you know what I mean. Um, as far as the rest of the acting, I'll get it out of the way here. The cast, probably I knew about 80% of the cast, um, uh, or at least I could re I recognize them. There's a lot of famous actors here. Um, let's see, ones I won't particularly go into on a rant, rant because number one, they weren't nominated, and number two, they don't, you know, aren't, they're, they're not in the top, like, five performances. Hal Hallbrook was great in the movie, uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt was great in the movie, uh, David Strathairn was great in the movie. Um, then the, there's kind of these three guys that that lead the uh, charge for getting Democratic uh, politicians to waiver their vote from nay to yay, and those are John Hawks, um, Bill uh, or, Tom, or gosh, Tim Blake Nelson, sorry, and also James Spader. And these three guys both give electrifying performances, especially James Spader, who kind of gets the more comedic of the three. Um, but certainly, yeah, some great stuff there. And then also I noticed, um, we had the new Freddy Krueger guy, you know, for, as, uh, Alexander Stevens, the vice president of the Confederate States. Um, for the life of me right now, I cannot remember the name of the actor, uh, I, I recognized him. For the Lord's sakes, I can't, Jackie Earl Haley, there we go. Sorry, he kind of left me for a little bit there. Uh, and a lot of these guys, a lot of these actors, and a lot of these characters, uh, with the exception probably of David Strathairn, get maybe three or four scenes uh, here and again, um, and then they, but they get the best out of those, and that's great. And the screenplay always has something for them to do, uh, which is also great. Um, now we'll get to the, the I've mentioned uh, uh, Danny Day Lewis, Sally Field. Okay, Sally Field was tremendous. Uh, in the fir her first scene, uh, she almost, her acting style and the way it was written started at first to seem like it was going to be a little bit of a cliché, 
But then by the end of that scene, then I saw, okay, they're going to work with this character and build her up. And then in the scene where she's mourning the death of her son in her son's room, their deceased son, Willie, then I said, okay, now we've got, now we've got a performance here. And I could see where it was kind of gradually building. And then there's the scene at the uh, grand reception where she kind of goes on a rant for a while to uh, Tommy Lee Jones about all sorts of stuff against him since he's, um, you know, and, and all that. But, uh, but yeah, that's, that scene was hilarious. And then uh, we get uh, the best acted scene of the year was one of her next scenes, her big and her biggest scene in the film, where uh, there's an argument about Joseph Gordon-Levitt, who plays uh, the oldest son, uh, Robert, um, wanting to fight for the North at the end of the war. And Daniel Day Lewis's character says, you know, why not? But you're not going to get into the forward action. You're going to be back toward the cities. And Sally Field lost a son already, mourns the death of her son, worried to death about her other son, uh, Tad Lincoln. Who, that's another great performance by the, the young actor. I don't, I wouldn't know his name. But he did, he did great. I liked his character a lot. He got a couple of good laughs. But, um... Boy, that argument they have was explosive. Boy, it was it was something. <laughs> That's for sure. You know, you have uh, you know the tension in that scene just builds and builds and builds, but there's no action. It's two people standing in a room or sometimes kneeling in a room, and they're shouting at the top of their lungs. And I felt as intense and as adrenaline pumped as a few key moments in Skyfall. That says a lot for a drama. I mean, tell me. I mean, tell me that's not true. If you've watched, if you've seen the film, tell me that scene does not get you as pumped, as excited, and as you know to see the act, great acting, and as you know as thrilled as Skyfall. It's incredible. It's incredible stuff. And then, um, yeah, just her whole performance was tremendous. But it has been noted, but I didn't think it made all that much difference. That Sally Field is actually about 20 years older than Mary Lincoln Todd in that year. They made her look young enough that it it fit the part anyways. And she's kind of, uh, you know, the same. She's weary kind of a little bit. And, you know, she's had all this crap through her life with uh, the death of her son and her, you know, husband being the president during the worst possible time. Um, you know, and it's... Um, yeah, definitely something that would ma almost, you know, age you physically for a great many reasons. Okay, maybe I've saved the best for last. Maybe. Tommy Lee Jones. Boy, Tommy Lee Jones. I heard from the first reviews that he was the scene stealer, that he was going to, you know, his os you know, the, the uh, premiere was toward the end of October, I think, and they said the day they got out of the screening, they said, uh, they said, to uh, Spielberg, they said, call up your studio and tell them to start getting an Oscar campaign ready for Tommy Lee Jones. Apparently they didn't have one ready for him or something, but boy, I'm glad they did get him a campaign enough so that he got an Oscar nom, because boy, he might win it. But I haven't seen The Master yet, and I haven't seen a, you know, a few of the other nominees in that category and do their work in their films, but uh, boy, Tommy Lee Jones, they don't lie. Every scene he's in, it doesn't matter if he is introduced toward the end, if he's you know in the you know in the scene from the start, or if he comes in in the middle. He owns every scene he's in, and he captivates us with every line he speaks. He makes us laugh. He makes us um, you know side with him at times. He makes us you know really happy. He makes us uh, smile just at the the greatness of his character and the the great dialogue he's delivering that is phenomenal, all the good speeches and stuff I mean by that. Boy, to, yeah, Tommy Lee Jones is phenomenal uh, as an actor. He has really, you know, he's gotten a few nominations over the years since The Fugitive, which was his big win, and he did good work before that, and he's done good work since, of course. But, boy, he he really, I think, he he's earned another Oscar, and I think they should give it to him personally. But I haven't I haven't seen the other nominees, so maybe I might uh, go back on that. Boy, good great performances from all three. Now, was Sally Field as good as Anne Hathaway? Uh, it's like that much of a difference. I can understand why this is a tight race, and I can understand that depending on pretty much the day that the uh, voters view the film, 
if they view them on the same day, they're screwed, and it's going to be up in the air totally to the voters. But if they say if they see Lane is one day, and maybe they're you know, you know, a little there, and then Lincoln, and then they're solid on that uh, field, might just snatch up and get it. And of course, if Lincoln wins Best Picture, and they you know the Academy voters you know um, have almost unanimously decide that maybe there's the chance, and this the same thing uh, kind of crept up on us last year, which was the feeling that, and the news going around, uh, speculating that the artist was going to be a clean sweep last year and win every category it was nominated for, but it didn't happen. Maybe it could happen with Lincoln, but I, I seriously doubt it, because the Academy would have to find a film uh, that would be up to the stature of Lord of the Rings Return of the King, up to the stature of Titanic, up to the stature of Ben-Hur, to win those 11 Academy Awards. But then again, all of them except uh, Return of the King did lose a few uh, you know, categories it was nominated for. So, uh, just, just a side note there. But, uh, but definitely a, uh, a few possibilities here for, for uh, certain categories where it's not entirely locked yet for a win, uh, I can understand why it was nominated, obviously, and I can understand if it does win, why, because it's all good work, solid work throughout. Uh, let's see, the cinematography by the guy's name I can't pronounce, he did War Horse, he's done, I think he did Schindler's List, and he's been working with Spielberg for many, many years, he's been collaborating with him for film after film after film, does a good job as usual. Uh, once again, like Lame is, there are a few shots, and also the editing comes into play with this too, where it, it doesn't really stop all that much. There's a scene actually kind of early on, one of like the ten scenes where Lincoln's talking with his cabinet, actually I think only like a few, in the cabinet room, and he's uh, and he gives kind of this story about him back before he was president. Uh, and then there's also a little bit he talks about, um, you know, this is the way to end the war past the 13th Amendment, when he was trying to get support from his cabinet to get the drive to get the uh, amendment going. Uh, or the push for the amendment, to get past going, I should say. And that whole thing, they probably only cut like a few times, but yeah, that camera fall, you know, it almost goes a complete 360 around this table. Uh, almost, but uh, but yeah, it's, uh, and, that, and that's good good uh, camera work also in the opening uh, Civil War scene. It's not, it's not very shaky. If it was, I, I missed it. But yeah, that's, I love that, I love that. When the cinematographer, like Roger Dinkins in Skyfall, knows how to keep the frickin' camera still. Uh, Gary Ross, I'm still gonna kill you for Hunger Games, all that business in the first, like, 45 minutes, almost being a nausea-filled thing, but then it, it, it kind of lessened as that film went on, but that's a different review. Um, but yeah, I definitely think that his nomination was a worthy one, though it, not everybody had put that down. I think The Master had gotten a few uh, uh, fans for that to get nominated, but it didn't. Um, now, editing. I think the editing by Michael Kahn is the best work he's done in a while. Michael Kahn is a great editor. Uh, he's done tremendous work over the years. You know, Raiders of the Lost Ark and, uh, you know, the entire Indiana Jones trilogy. And then um, uh, Schindler's List. And uh, I think he did Saving, Saving Private Ryan as well. Uh, he's, uh, and he's, a, he's worked on many other great films as well. Boy, he does a good job here as well. Especially toward the end when they're uh, when they're uh, casting their votes and they go to everybody. There's a. It's so amazing how how the guy Michael Kahn visions everything in his head. You know, he sees it all in his head. He says, "Okay, we'll cut now. We'll cut now. We'll cut now." And the audience just follows right along, and it's seamless. And it's totally one of the best edited. And then there's lots of dissolves and stuff. And all of that makes the feel that what I'm leading up to here is. This feels like a 50s, like late 50s, early 60s drama. Not, not totally unlike uh, young Mr. Lincoln back from 39, uh, way back, <laughs> but uh, where they would do a lot of this stuff. And um, it's just, you know, the color and the picture quality is better uh, than it was back then, or it's not in black and white, depending on what era you're in. But yeah, and that, that old quality kind of feel makes it uh, an, an, a unique viewing experience as well. Kind of like um, Argo, uh, the opening logo for Warner Brothers was the old logo. 
because it's in the 70s. The movie's set in the 70s, so they put in the 70s Warner Brothers logo. And I thought, right when I saw that, in the when uh, I first saw Argo, I got excited. I said, oh boy, you know, they've got something up their sleeve, I said. And then, yeah, it didn't, that didn't let me down, neither did Lincoln. Boy, though, that last uh, 40 minutes or so, when they're, you know, getting the bill passed and everything, and they try to table it so that they vote for it later, boy, that is exciting. That is exhilarating. And it's uh, kind of like the ending of Skyfall a little bit. Uh, now, which is better? Oh, boy. Uh, don't ask me that, because I don't have an answer yet. I'd have to see Skyfall again, because it's, it's been a little bit, little bit of a while. I know how it ends. I remember how it ends. I don't have a short-term memory loss or anything. But boy, uh, both endings are genuinely pleasing uh, and genuinely exciting. Uh, for different reasons, probably. Definitely, yeah. Um, and I think a lot of the uh, historical depictions of certain people were, were very accurate in this film as well. And the costume design was great. All the technical stuff was at the top of its game. Okay, do I have any criticisms of the film? Uh, it's a, there are a couple small ones, very, very small, that could have been fixed. Number one probably being um, maybe, it, you know, and I understand that Danny day is trying to establish his character, and in doing so, he definitely more and more solidifies with each tale he tells, um, you know, his character being a storyteller as well as a, our nation's leader back then. Um, but boy, I thought a few of his stories kind of could have been condensed down or almost cut completely, and it would have maybe flowed a little better, but I, I'm not Michael Kahn. I can't make that call. But I'll tell you, his story about, uh, oh, who was it? Ethan Allen, I think, and uh, the George Washington thing, that was hilarious. That was like the joke of the year in films. Ain't nothing makes an Englishman more than uh, the picture of George Washington Boy, that was great. The theater uh, that I was in, the audience really laughed at that. Like, and there's a few, you know, small laughs for the movie. Nothing that makes you entirely laugh out loud. But like the stuff with uh, in the opening, he was talking about uh, two, like uh, his barber, you know, Abraham Lincoln's barbers being like, you know, killing themselves and stuff. It was funny. And then, um, you know, and he had this thing where he was getting ready to maybe tell his big speech, and he had like a couple lines, and he said. Ask my speech, <laughs> and that was good, and a lot of his stuff was good. And uh, Tommy Lee Jones had a few really good moments when he, you know, you know, sounded out the syllables for Republican or Democrat or whatever it was. Uh, uh, you know, that was funny, and uh, I thought a lot of um, a lot of moments here and there with uh, James Spader were really funny as well. When he's when he cusses both times to the extremities of the f word, which you know. I think you know, Lincoln reached its uh, length there at how many F words you can use in a PG-13 movie, which is, as far as I know, two or three. Uh, but um, but yeah, I think uh, his char his character got a few good ones when he's fighting with the uh, uh, the Democratic uh, politician there in that one scene. It's not actually shown in real time, but it's shown as almost like a little bit of a flashback. Um, when he said he almost killed me and stuff like that, that was funny. And then uh, very funny also when the he and John Hawks, I think, are gambling, and then he uh, and then the president walks in. Well, I'll be. <laughs> that was that was funny. Uh, good stuff there from him as well. Um, now about the direction and best picture noms. Uh, boy, I think Steven Spielberg has earned his due for another nomination. Uh, it's his first nomination in, what, seven years, almost a decade now. And it's, um, yeah, a really great, great film. Definitely worthy of 12 nominations, and some people say maybe even more. I Right now, I wouldn't disagree with that, but maybe on a second watching later on, I might, you know, depending... Since I'm in Oscar, uh, I'm on my Oscar quest right now, Rewatching unless I see a film that I haven't seen yet, that immediately grabs me and tell and I say to myself, this takes this takes over Argo for the best film I've seen all year. Unless I see one of those, I won't watch it again in the theater. I'll see it again on DVD, like I said, Les Mis. Uh, but Lincoln definitely I prefer over Les Mis at this point. Ten out of ten for Lincoln. Boy, what a what a superb movie. I thought 
just every everything was right, everything was great. Uh, the audience I had with it, there was a, lo a young little boy, probably about only five or six years old. And I was worried because I'd heard that, you know, not a whole lot of stuff. And I said, oh, I don't know why these this family kind of dragged their six-year-old to this film. But when it was over, and as far as I knew, he he didn't go to the bathroom or anything, which is really hard for a, uh, like a six or a seven-year-old to sit through a two-and-a-half-hour movie without getting up. And at the end, he stood up and he was clapping and he was kind of going like this toward the screen. I thought, oh my god, it's the race riots all over again or something, except it's young kids with Lincoln. That's weird. It's like a cult film or something. It's like Spielberg's trying to pass something on to the young children. But, uh, but no. Um, and I'm glad. I'm glad for that. And a lot of uh, families have, uh, just whole families have gone to this, uh, from what I've heard, uh, and from the money it's made. Right now, Best picture-wise for nominations, this is the top money maker. But the way that Django Unchained is making still some cash, they said it might overtake Lincoln if Lincoln doesn't climb back up in the charts. Which uh, I checked today, and apparently this weekend, uh, Lincoln might you know catch up a little bit, but it it will not it will not get to the top spot. I don't think in the next couple of weeks, unless uh, 20th Century Fox kind of almost uh, big time re-releases it into like 3,300 theaters or something, which, as far as I know, the most it went into was like 2250 or something like that, not a whole lot. And I hear that next week they're going to expand Silver Linings Playbook to 2,500 theaters. Uh, so maybe by then I'll have seen it, maybe, and then uh, Life of Pi, I think I, I might be able to. Still not 100% sure yet. Tomorrow uh, I might have a review for Life of Pi, and that'll be, that'll be 1, 2, 3, 4... Uh, four out of the nine I've seen. So, um, and then if uh, if uh, Silver Linings Playbook, if I can see that next weekend, that'll be five of nine. I'll have a review for that if if I see it. And then let's see, let, what's left? Zero Dark Thirty might come in next week, or the week after, you know. And then that would be seven of nine, uh, or five, six, sorry, six of nine, which would be which I would be happy with that. And then uh, Amour and um, and, uh, what am I forgetting? Um, and then Beast of the Southern Wild, and also, Lord, what am I forgetting? Um, hey, yeah, well, that's, that's, yeah, what's the other one I'm forgetting? I can't, I can't remember it right now. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Sorry, I, I really have to think about this for a second here, because I can't remember it. Uh, the other picture, let's see, there was Argo, Beast of Southern Wild, uh, Amour, um, Django, oh, Django, I can't believe I forgot, <laughs> yeah, and then that would be nine, but I don't, I might see Django before then, but Beast of the Southern Wild and Amour I'd have to see on DVD, or I'd have to, you know, spend, you know, a lot more bucks to see Amour probably, I'd have to go seek it out somewhere and travel all over the country to find it, uh, which I don't think I'll do, uh, at least not right now, I don't think. But if you people keep watching, and if I get some money, maybe I'll be able to. Yeah, definitely. So, yeah, I think I think that'll do it for this review. Go see Lincoln if you haven't yet, and I, it's made a lot of money, so I understand a lot of people have already seen it. But if you loved it, go see it again. Why not? It's got 12 nominations. There's a reason for it. So, yeah, I'll sign off and say be watching you and hopefully you'll be watching this video and the others and following my Oscar quest and hopefully I can fulfill it as best as possible before the 24th of February. Got that right. Hmm. God, I feel so embarrassed. I can't believe I've, I've mentioned Django like like two minutes before I was naming him off and I can't remember it. Uh.